Hi, my name's Mercedes. Welcome to Highlands Online. If it's your first time joining us or you're a regular at Highlands, it's so great to have you. Welcome. We'd love to hear from you on our Instagram, Facebook, or via our website if you have any questions or prayer requests, or you just want to say hi. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Expansion. I love the theme for this expansion. What was what is and what is to come. And over the last few weeks or right through this month, we've been watching and hearing testimony after testimony about what God's been doing, how God's been moving. How many know he's not done yet? There's more to be done. God's going to continue to move. And we've looked at what was and we've, we've, we've realised that we can answer what God has been doing. We can look back over our own lives. We can look back over the life of the church and see what God's been doing. Salvations, baptisms, healing, Faith steps, purchasing 100 acres in high fields. All sorts of things that God's been moving, providing breakfast you know, for kids at schools, all sorts of things that God's been doing. We know what was and what is. We can look at our current circumstances and we can, we can consider what we're seeing right now and know what is. But when we come to this point of what is to come, we don't really know what's to come, do we? We don't really know. We cannot really see what's to come. Well, I believe we can. See, I believe the scriptures show us what's to come. How many like to know the future? Yeah. Some of us go, no, maybe not. Maybe I don't really want to know what's, what's happening in the future. But, but, you know, we can know a bit about what's to come. And this, so this morning, as we tie off this expansion series and we lead into what does it mean for me to have faith to what's to come, I want us to understand that in there's places in the scriptures that show us not only what was and what is, but what it, what's to come? What could we look forward to in the future? I guess my excitement about what's to come started before I was even a Christian. Just before my 20th birthday, I almost didn't make my 20th birthday. I was in a car accident. Some of you may not be aware. At that stage, I was at uh, Teachers College in Melbourne, and um, I was training to become a physical education teacher. And I was driving home from uni, and I was in my mum's little Morris 1100, those of you, yep. And it was a busy time. I was involved in a drama, a play within the uni and a whole bunch of other things. And long story short, all I can remember is driving onto the freeway. What actually happened was I got, got off the freeway and uh, driving down a road on my little Morris 1100 had a head on with a Toyota high ace with a bull bar. I don't remember any of that, so I can't tell you the details except what was told to me. But what I do know is that I snapped the seatbelt, so it must have been frayed, bounced off the steering wheel and went through the windscreen. Just short, all at my birthday's in September, September 27th, if any of you. So just, just sort of, <laughs> nobody's writing that down, I'm not sure. Just short of my 20th birthday. Um, and the, um, the, apparently I was, I was actually off the bonnet on the road. I snapped my jaw in two places, cut my face open down here and down here. Um, I was in hospital, I ended up getting a blood clot in my, in my leg. So it wasn't good. In fact, it was the year, my first year of university, for it, so I'd just been almost a year out of high school. And I remember, I knew it was really, really a problem for me because I was in hospital, my jaw had already been wired up, my face was not the way that it looked, not this pretty face, <laughs> not the way that it, it looked. And I remember some people, from mates from school came in and one of the girls from my high school walked in, took one look at me and ran out crying. I knew I wasn't looking good at that stage. <laughs> Swollen. Funny, I ended up, I end up, um, the, I talk about going through the windscreen. I say funny. I end up getting a little, bit of, a little bit of glass stuck in my throat. And that stayed there for, I said to the doctor, what's this lump? And he said, look, it's probably a bit of windscreen, but don't worry, it'll probably work its way out. You don't need to, to cut it out. So I'd stay there and I used to just talk and do this. And it was there for like 15 years. And this one day it was playing, well, oh, it's a bit rough. And I, and I, I squeezed it and it popped out. If anyone wants to see it, I've got it in my bag. Kaz said, <laughs> Kaz said, that's just gross. Don't bring that up. But if, any of you guys that want to see it, I've got it in my bag. I'll show you later. Although the little container it's in when you open it, it's a bit smelly. But it, let me come back to where I was. Looking back now, looking back now, I, um, I remember hearing the nurses say, I can't believe this guy survived the accident. And at that stage, I wasn't, I wasn't a Christian. At that stage, I, I think I probably knew about God, but I certainly wasn't a Jesus follower. 
But in that moment, I started to question my eternity. I said, was that all there is to life? And in some ways, God took a horrific moment and started me on a journey of discovery where I started to go, well, is God real? And if I die, then is that it? Is that all there is to life and eternity? Car was totaled. Mum wasn't happy. I think she was sadder about the car being crashed than me being in the hospital. I'm not sure that's true. But I didn't know why that had all happened and why I'd survived. But looking back now on that August day, my life and my time on this earth could have been over. Reflecting back now as a follower of Jesus, I have no doubt that God wasn't finished with me yet. It's a passage in Psalm 90. It's actually the oldest psalm. Of the 150 psalms in the Bible, Psalm 90 is the oldest. And it's written by Moses, and it's actually a prayer to God. And Psalm 90 verse 12 says, Teach us to number our days, Lord God, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So in this psalm, Moses is praying for instruction and revelation. He's saying, teach us, teach me to number my days. Now, I don't think he's actually saying, teach me to count every day of my life and try and work out how many days I've got left. Not a bad idea, but I don't think that's what he's saying. I think instead what he's, Moses is asking God is, how do I make every day count? Teach me to number my days. Teach me to be aware that I've only got a certain number of days in this earth and I don't want it to be groundhog day. I don't want to just go through the motions. I, I want to make a difference with every moment of every day of my life. And some of you this morning are here and you're here on a Sunday. Because, and why are you here? Because it's Sunday and that's what you do. And I just wonder what it would be like for you to change that to this is a new day and another day and another opportunity I get to experience more of the fullness of God and to express that into the lives of the people around us. See, in this interaction, God was actually showing Moses as Moses was praying. He was saying, count your days to make your days count. Make the most of every moment. And there's been moments in my life, that car accident and other situations where Kaz and I have said, we're going to make the most of every moment because we don't know how long we've got left. But we do know that God has given me another day to breathe for a purpose, not just to go through the motions of life. See, once I did turn my heart and my life to Jesus, I started reflecting more on that moment. And I realized that God wasn't done with me yet. And if you're alive today, just... Check your policy. John's checking his note, just making sure. If you're alive today, if you're here today, can I say to you in all truth, prophetically, God isn't done with you yet. Whatever you're sensing about your life, maybe you're on the journey, you're here and you're just checking God out, just checking church out. This is the best place for you to be right now because you're going to hear some truths today about the love of God for you that he loves you, you're not an accident, despite whether you were planned by your mother and father, God knew you were going to be born. He knew you are going to be in this place right now. He knew you are going to be hearing this message and reading through the scriptures we're going to open up today for a purpose. Because he wants to say to you, he's not done with you yet. What was, was, what is, is, the highs and lows, the celebratory amazing moments in your life gone past and the struggles. And he's not done yet. In fact, what's to come? Here it is. God would say the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. No matter how great some of your, your mountaintop moments are, the best is yet to come. And that's not just a lovely phrase. I want to say to you this morning that I believe biblically God says the best is yet to come. One, because when we do finish our days in this earth and we enter into the fullness of eternity with him in heaven, it's like nothing we could ever understand or hope for. For those of us who have asked Jesus into our life, Asked him to be our Lord and Saviour. Taken that moment where we've asked him to forgive us our sins and asked him to lead our life. We've stepped into that place of, of repentance. God says eternity is now on earth and will continue through heaven. But I want to say the best is yet to come isn't just about our time in heaven. It's about the rest of our days on this earth. What's to come? The best of your life is to come. What's to come? Opportunity. I can promise you from the scriptures, God's saying, I'm going to give you opportunities. To experience me, God, like never before. I'm going to give you ways where you're going to be able to lead others, serve others, encourage others, speak life into others. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a life, not, not the perfect life. There'll be challenges, but I'm going to be with you and for you and open doors of opportunity. We sung that beautiful song before. Um, where is it? It's, it? I wrote the words down as we were going. 
Impossible is what God does. I love the way when Megan led us in that song, impossible is what God does. He wants us to know that. So wherever you're at in your journey, what's to come opportunity for him to move in your life and to bring the impossible into being. And I love the second part of that verse that we read. It says, why? Why should we count the days? So that we may gain wisdom in our hearts. I don't about you, but more than ever before, I want not just, not just worldly wisdom, I want God's wisdom. I want to be in situations where God speaks to me. When I'm with, with my mates, and God speaks to me about something about one of them, maybe prophetically. He says, pray for him about that. I want for you, if you're in school, that you know the strength of God. And when God, God asks you to step, to, to step aside and be, be set apart from others, you go, I'm going to step into that conf- confidently because I know who my God is. You know, if, if you're in a situation where things are tough in your relationship, you go, no, no, no I'm going to be humble with my husband. I'm going, to be, I'm, going to, I'm going to be trusting God with my wife and know that he's got this because he's going to give me wisdom. See, the simple biblical definition of wisdom is seeing things the way God sees them. And God says, when God says, <clears throat> seek wisdom, he's saying, what I want you to do is see things the way I see them. I want to give you my wisdom so that you see things not the way the world sees it, but a wisdom that he brings about the way he sees things. See, with God, today and tomorrow holds endless possibilities. You don't want to stop and say there are so many of us as Christians that live like we don't know Christ. I don't don't mean that as judgment. I just mean that as an observation. We live our lives so much as if we don't know Christ. We don't. The the things I've been saying about this God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could hope or imagine. If if we look at that and we see the best is yet to come, and we get up in the morning like that, we're excited. We come to church ready, not just to sing to God, but to experience Him, expecting Him to speak into my life, expecting Him to show me stuff, encourage me, maybe show me some areas that that I'm not, I shouldn't be doing, or shouldn't be saying, whatever that might be. It's that walk with Him that He wants me to be on. It's endless opportunities, endless possibilities. Each day counts, and when every day counts, we don't just have good days. We have God days. We don't just have perfect days because there's no such thing. There'll be ups and downs. There'll be struggles. There'll be trials. But in the midst of it, it's still a God day because God is for me and he has my hand and he's leading me through that tough meeting, that tough conversation. Days, times, moments where we see the fingerprints of God all over him. That's what the future holds. That's what's to come. That you would see, you would experience days, moments, where you experience the fullness of God. The God who created the heavens and the earth, you experience his love, his protection, his direction. That's what's to come if we seek him. Each day filled with mission and meaning. Not wasted days, just God days. What is, what was, what is, what's to come. Be assured when you're a follower of Jesus, God's promise is the best is yet to come. No matter how old you are. We're going to look at Moses in a moment and see the age that he was at when the best of his life was experienced. I had a friend and a mentor many years ago back in Melbourne at a church that, uh, that we, Kaz and I were a part of for 17 years, a church called Gateway. And uh, one of the guys there, one of the elders that was there when we first walked through the doors with our, with our eldest daughter, Brooke, as a baby. His name's Tony Washington. Tony um, was diagnosed with cancer and, and really has journeyed the last 25, 30 years working through cancer diagnosis and all sorts of things. Tony used to continually say this. He used to say, Murray, always remember, your present situation is not your final destination. And then he would say, the best is yet to come. Well, he was renowned for it. The best. You'd see Tony and you'd say, what's Tony? The best is yet to come. And in the midst of his horror, in the midst of his celebration, what came out of his mouth, what came out of his life was the same. The best is yet to come. God's at work. He's here. He's at work. He's bringing things. So in light of my accident, I'm reminded that life's not a playground, that life is a battleground, that every day there's a battle waged for my soul and there's an enemy trying to rob and kill and destroy, not just physically, but in every area of my life, going to try and rob my relationship with my wife. He's going to try and rob my relationship with my kids. He's going to try and steal my joy. He's going to try and fill things in my life so there's no peace. That's what the enemy comes. It's a battleground. But the good news is, The best is yet to come. 
when I put my hope and my trust in Jesus, when I didn't let him lead my relationship with my wife, not my frustrations, when I let him take me by the hand in the struggles and the challenges of work and not allow the struggles and challenges to pull me down, I start to experience more of him and the best is yet to come. See, God brings us days of expectation. You are not here by accident. There's a purpose and, and God wants you to experience and respond to him. See, that's the role we have. Experience and respond. So many Christians experience, oh, God, I just felt the presence of God this morning. Great. What's your response? Today, later on today, is one way we can respond. Where once a year we say, okay, we're going we're gonna to respond with our generosity, with our finance into some of the things. And you've heard a lot about that over the last month and I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. But that's one of many ways that we can say, I'm not just going to experience, I'm going to respond. Oswald Chambers says this. He says, keep your life so constantly in touch with God that his surprising power can break through at any point. I love that. Be so closely walking with God that his power, his surprising power can break through at any point and we're ready because we're saying here's a new day, here's a new opportunity for God to move. And then he goes on and he says, live in, in a constant state of expectancy and leave room for God to come in as he decides. This is the day the Lord's made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad and I'm expectant for what's to come. There are three main reasons why I believe it's best to live with an attitude of the best is yet to come. One, because I believe that God is in control. And when you understand and believe God is in control and God is for you and not against you, then we walk down a pathway of saying, my God who is able to do immeasurably more than I can hope or dream of, he's in control of my life. I give my life over to him. So I'm expectant. Because he loves pouring out his blessings and his grace and his mercy on his kids. You might be in a moment right now where you're calling out for his healing. You're calling out for his presence. You're calling out for his peace. Can I promise you he loves you? And he sees you. And the best is yet to come in your relationship with him. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, And I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day in which Christ returns. God is in control. Secondly, how do I know the best is yet to come? Because God is good. God is good. All the time. And all the time, we roll that off our tongue. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Do you believe it? In, this, in, the, in the midst of your circumstance, do you believe it? Because he is. God's in control. God is good. And thirdly, the reason I know the best is yet to come is because God wants his best for you. He wants his best for you. He wants his best for you. Not what you think is best for you. He's got his best for you and he wants to bring that. And if we're open and if we're ready and if we're expectant and we're looking for him, he'll bring it. He'll pour it out. But we miss it because we're all about what I want and what I think and we're not let, nestling into the God who has immeasurably more. We're all about what I think is best for me. Jeremiah 29, 11, we, we, this, message, this verse gets um, preached about a lot. But the prophet says this, speaking on behalf of God, God's word through him. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. See, for me personally, for us here as a church at Highlands, I believe, not just as lip service, I believe, head, heart, spirit, that the best is yet to come for you and for us. And as we remain faithful to him, and as we remain obedient to him, he will continue to pour out his favour and his blessings. He's been doing it. <clears throat> you know, he's provided 100 acres in Highfields for us to, to build an early learning centre and, and a Christian school. And how many know that right now in this world, particularly in Australia, we need Christian education more than ever before. There needs to be more Christian schools. We need to have an auditorium, a place where we can gather as a church where we can invite people for coffee at a cafe, where people can come and we can meet and we can see God moving powerfully. We've got that. We've got, we're, seeing, we're seeing God move in our youth. Mitch, our youth pastor, came with an idea that we might set something up here, that we might get a few youth people coming along. Now, every Friday night, we're getting over 50 kids, young people coming, hearing the word of God preached. They did an expansion offering. Our youth 
decided they wanted to give an expansion pledge, an expansion offering. Mitchie shouted out, mate, don't come up. How much did Highlands altogether give? So both campuses, how much did they, have they pledged the youth? $1,100. Both the Middle Ridge campus and the Highfields campus of youth just were in, 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 encouraged to enter in. What would it look like for us to, to, to give to the bigger cause? Of that $1,100, how much is that did high, the Highfield youth? 450 almost half, this campus. God's moving. And that wasn't, you know, Mitchie. Mitchie's not one of those, come on, we've got to. It was just like, what's God saying to you? Let's, what, what would it look like for us to step into that space? And these young people, these young teenagers saying, I believe God is moving and I, I want to sow into that. I want to be a part of that. We've got almost 100 kids in our kids program. We're seeing small groups grow and develop. We've got people wanting to join groups. You know, we've got more people wanting to join groups than groups at the moment. So please come and see me if you want to start a group. We want to get people involved in that. We've seen people get breakthrough. We've seen videos of healing. We're seeing marriages restored. Kaz and I met with a couple just yesterday and we're seeing their marriage being restored because the Holy Spirit is moving because God is not finished yet. He's not done yet. He's still moving. And so we get the opportunity of going, I don't believe in a God who just says, oh, well, that'll do. That'll do is not words that come out of God's mouth. What does he say? The best is yet to come. I've got more for your marriage. That's prophetic for, one, for some of you this morning. I've got more for your marriage. Let's look at an example in the Scriptures where God's not done. Opportunities come up. It's in Luke chapter 5. Jesus has been preaching and speaking. Luke chapter 5 from verse 4. If you want to bring that up on the screen, that would be great. And Jesus has been preaching and teaching. And then, then when he would finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where, there's deep, where it's deeper. So he's been preaching, he's been standing on the boats of the fishermen, of some of his followers. And he's preaching. And then he says, go out to where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, Simon who then became Peter later on, we've worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let down my nets again. I, I don't know, I, I, I tend to read that and think, maybe I'm not right, but I read that and think, we've been out all night, God. Master, Jesus, we've been out all night. But if you say so, well, okay. It's almost like there's a sarcasm. I don't know if you picked that up and maybe it's just me. It's almost like he's being sarcastic because this is really early on in the days where Jesus is starting to minister. But if you say so, I'll let my nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat and soon both boats were filled with fish on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realised what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. That's why I thought he was being sarcastic earlier. It's like, I'm such a sinful man. I didn't believe that you were going to do this. I didn't believe the best was yet to come. I thought we we're going to have to go all this work again. I'm absolutely wrecked. And look what you did. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they'd caught, as were the others that were with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and they followed Jesus. See, the disciples, the fishermen, they were at their wits end. They've been fishing. Did you get it? They've been fishing all day. What was and what is? We've been fishing all day and actually over the last few days and been getting nothing. We've got debts we owe. We owe, we owe Levi, Matthew, the tax collector. We owe him a bucket load of money. Or you know, we, we owe so much. There's no fish. We haven't caught fish tonight. We haven't caught fish for the last week. They're at their wits end. They're deflated, deflated and they're defeated. That's what was and that's what is. And Jesus shows up and he changes everything because he shows them what's to come. Another version in that, that verse um, about, about throwing your nets down, another version in John chapter 21 says, Jesus said, throw your nets on the other side of the boat and there you'll get some. Throw your net on the other side of the boat. What would it look like for you and I to start to throw our nets on the other side of the boat? What would it look like when we're in a situation where we're feeling defeated and deflated and we look at our lives so far and God's not moving in that area. And rather than going, and God says, do this. What would it look like for us to have faith to go, I'm going to continue to trust my God. I'm going to throw my net on the other side. I'm going to continue to trust my God. I'm going to have an attitude of throwing my net on the other side. Despite my circumstances, despite what was, despite what is, I know my God is a God who is to come. And what does that look like? But notice this. Jesus didn't just fill the boats. He didn't just go, Close your eyes, guys. Now open. And all of a sudden, the boats were full of fish. Now he could have, couldn't he? 
Same thing with when, when, uh, when he was preaching. And there were, what, there were 5,000 people, 5,000 men plus women and children. And then, then they're all hungry. And they looked around and nobody had food. One kid had a little bit of snack, a little bit of bread and some fish. Now he could have just said, close your eyes, open, food. But he didn't, did he? He said, go and see what you've got. Pass the buckets around. Bring back. What did he say? He said, he didn't just say, close your eyes, fish on the boat. He says, cast your net on the other side. You see, if the best is yet to come, the way that Jesus works, the way that God works, he says, I want you to be involved in this. So not only is it opportunity, but it is obedience. That's the second part of what's to come. What's to come? Opportunity for God to move, but also obedience. That he, we have a role to play in this. It's not like, okay, God, you said you're going to fix it, so fix it. It's like, God, I believe you can fix it. Is there, is there anything you want me to do? What are what, what, what you calling me to do? How, how can I respond to this? What does faith look like for me in the next st stages? How can I be obedient? What's to come? God always gives you and I a role to play. Throw your nets on the other side of the boat. Trust him. What's he saying? Do this. Maybe it's giving to this situation. Well, I don't have much to give. Give anyway. Maybe it's, I want you to go to that person who hurt you. I want you to write him a letter. I want you to, oh, how could I... Be obedient. Whatever he says in the moment, what would it look like to just trust him that the best is yet to come when you're obedient in that space? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. For those who love him. For those who love him. Love is an action. God's saying, I want you to follow me. The best is yet to come for those who follow me, who put their love for me into action. That's the core on our lives. Let's put our love into action. C.S. Lewis wrote this, There are far, far better things ahead than anything we leave behind. Far, far better things ahead than anything we leave behind. What's to come? God wants to bring opportunity. The best is yet to come. What's to come? Opportunity. He's going to call you. He's going to call you. He's going to give you opportunity to respond to him. To be faith-filled in your response to him. In lots of different areas. Every day of your life, God will give you an opportunity. And if your ears are close to his lips, and if they're not, if you, if you don't, if you're not hearing from God, just ask him. God, I want to hear from you. Show me. Show me. Take my hand. Lead me. Guide me. Direct me. You know, we're placed here on this earth to throw our nets on the other side continually. We're placed here on this earth for His purposes. So don't, let, don't allow your dreams of yesterday to become bitter regrets of today. If God's placed a dream in your heart, hold on. Don't let it go. Trust Him. Trust Him. What was, what is, what is to come. He's writing a testimony for you. He's in the midst of writing a testimony of what's to come. And he's going to provide opportunity. And he's going to look for you to be obedient. Just like he was with the guys who said, nothing changes, God. We've been fishing like this for weeks. Just last night, nothing. Right in this spot, nothing. Throw your net on the other side. What's he saying? Have a different attitude. Don't throw it. Don't do what you've been doing. Same spot. Trust me now. Throw your net the other side. Watch what I do. See, that's the church I want to be a part of. The church that says God is about the impossible. We saw testimony after testimony over the last month of what God's been doing. You know, when you're younger, you look ahead and you want to grow up and, you know, you, you want to experience life. And, you know, there's maybe even young guys in the room right now and, you know, in school and you're thinking about, oh, when I get to be 18 and get my own car and get my independence and when I'm 21, actually it's 17 here you get your license, isn't it? Victoria's 18. They get to drive. Do you believe that? They get the license at 7, 8. Man. I don't get it. Don't get it. Anyway. And, and, you know, you start to think about when you get older. What does it look like when you get older? And I can't wait till I get my I can't wait till I can't wait. And then when we've grown up and we get older, we yearn for the past and we want to go back to what things were like when they were young. But when we work with God, no matter what our age, the best is yet to come. For the teenagers, God's got you guys and He's ready to open doors of opportunity. If you're ready to walk with Him and be obedient and be open for opportunity, watch what He does. And I'm not going to point out the oldest person in the room, but for all of those between the oldest person in the room and the youngest, it's the same story. 
Moses is a great example. I I just want to close with this. When Moses was 80, 80, he was confronted with Pharaoh and he walked towards Pharaoh and he saw God miraculously miraculously set his people free from slavery. If you want to check it out, Exodus chapter 3. Right through Exodus, an amazing story. At 80 years of age, he saw the Red Sea part. He saw manna fall from heaven. He even spoke with God face to face. Throughout his life, Moses lived expectantly. He looked ahead to what could do. He didn't get stuck in the moment. He didn't think about what was and write God off because God didn't do things the way He wanted to. He walked into the future. And even when Moses was 120 years old, in the final years of his life on earth, on earth, even then, he understood that his life with God was just getting started. And he would never see an end to God's greatness and God's love. See, regardless of your age, youngest to oldest, our God is at work in us. Our God is at work through us. Let me finish with this. Corrie Tim Boone. I love, I love her story. If you don't know much about Corrie Tim Boone, I haven't got time to explain it, but amazing story of a faithful woman in horrific times. She writes this. When we're on the beach, we only see a small part of the ocean. However, we know that there is much more beyond the horizon. We only see a small part of God's great love, a few jewels of His great riches, but we know there is much more beyond the horizon of God. And then she says, the best is yet to come when we see Jesus face to face. If you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, all of this, all the precepts of this is based around people who say, I want to follow Jesus. I invite Jesus into my life. So we're going to take a moment right now. I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to miss the best is yet to come for you in God because you haven't invited Him into your, into your life. So whether you've never invited Him into your life or whether you did a long time ago, but your faith has moved so far back where I'm talking about this stuff and you're going, I'm not there and I need to be. And you know it's time to come back. I want to give you a moment right now to pray a simple prayer, to step in to the faith and the hope that God brings into your life that says the best is yet to come. Would you bow your heads? Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. I wonder if that's you. I wonder this morning, don't, don't, don't leave today without inviting the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth to come and to dwell in your life and to lead you and guide you and direct you. And if that's you, if you're like, Murray, that's me. I want to I experience the best that God has for me. I want to experience the best that God has for me. I need Jesus in my life. If that's you, could I pray for you? Just raise your hand right now and just say, Murray, that's me. Pray for me. I want to experience Jesus. Thank you. See that hand? That's amazing. That's so good. So good. So good. Who else? I need Jesus. Yep. Awesome. I see that hand. That's awesome. So good. So good. People here saying, I need Jesus. I want to experience the best God has for me. I want to invite Jesus into my life. Who else? Before I pray, don't miss this moment. We've got people in this place saying, I want to accept Jesus. Who else? Before I pray. Just shoot that hand up right now. Don't miss this moment. Maybe you've, it's been, you've been away from God and it's time to come back. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Let the Holy Spirit come and do an amazing work of healing. Open your eyes and open your ears and open your hearts. So good, guys. So good. Church, can we pray this together? If you raised your hand, I want you just to pray this simple prayer with me and then continue to pray. But we're going to invite Jesus into that space in your heart. So let's pray this together, church. Dear God, thank you for your Holy Spirit to come, to minister, to heal my heart. I receive you into my heart right now to be my Lord and be my Saviour and to bring your future for my life. Forgive me for ignoring you in the past. I'm a Christian. I'm a Jesus follower. And the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just encourage those people who made decisions. I know that, I know that heaven is clapping a lot louder than that right now. Heaven is celebrating. The, the Bible says when we say, I want Jesus, heaven explodes. That's what the Bible says. Heaven explodes in a good way. Just before we finish up today, we're going to have one more song. 
this is this expansion season. And, and I wanted to tap on the back end of what we talked about. And Sam's just brought out a couple of buckets and we're gonna do this really quickly. But we are seeking to press into God about what's to come. We're seeking for opportunity and we're seeking to be obedient with a, with a one-off pledge, a one-off offering. And we've said to you, what are you believing for for your own life? And we've, Kaz mentioned about writing down, what are you believing for and putting it up on a prayer, prayer board out there. And we've got that what's to come. We want you to write those down. What are you believing for in your own life? Not just in finance, but in every area. We're going to throw our nets on the other side there, but we're also doing that here. Aside from our ties, we're saying, what could you pledge this year that sows specifically into the work of the church? We're believing for God to continue to move powerfully. So we're coming to a time now where we're going we're gonna to bring those faith pledges. So on the back of the booklet, there's two, the back two pages. One is a, a pledge card. Some of you have already come and, and filled that out and been praying about it through the week. Some of you are going to fill it out now. Some of you are going to say, Murray, I need another week, and that's totally fine. And we'll give you the opportunity to next week to bring it. But we would love for you to, it's a pledge. You don't have to bring the finances. It's like, this is what I believe God is saying to us about seeking opportunity and being obedient. We're going to bring our faith-filled pledges into this expansion offering. You've heard the areas before about what's to come, but let me go through them again. The future of the building of the land. This is what we're sowing into right now. We're waiting for one more signature. And we're believing that the government is saying we have to wait till after the election. I don't think they have to. They've decided to. But we're believing in faith before the end of this year. There's going to be that final signature that says, yes, we give you ministerial designation. You can build a church as well as a school and an early learning centre. We've already got that. We're believing that in faith and then we know that we're going to need finances to make that work. We're also believing in faith for this, for this particular um, offering and this pledging to build 10 solar-powered community fresh wells in Vietnam. Ken preached a while ago when he talked about that we have the opportunity of providing fresh water. We're going to do that through the church. And so part of the giving is going to be able to build at least 10. We want to do more than 10, but at least 10 fresh water wells, solar panelled, driven by the sun, where they can start drinking fresh water and get rid of sickness. But people will come to the church for fresh water. And guess what? They're going to get living water as well. We're believing for that. That's what this pledging is all about. We're believing we're, going to, we're, we're planting churches in Melbourne, a church called Society Church, which has just started. Josh Bull and his wife have just started. They've already been given an old church building that was derelict. They've been given it. They're going, thank you, Jesus. We want to help and support them as well as other churches all around the world. We want to support Christian missionaries in Asia Pacific. And then, of course, we want to continue to do some work around here. That's just some of what we want to do. It's in the booklets. But I get excited in these moments because this is where we see the Holy Spirit really move. Not out of obligation, out of opportunity and obedience. What's God saying? What's God saying? I'm going to pray and then just... As, as the band are just playing quietly in the background, just feel to come, drop your pledges in, and then I'll come and pray again at the end. I'm not going to press any more to this moment. This is not a, a moment of trying to twist people's arms. We only do this once a year. And then we celebrate. We go out, jumping castles, food, and we celebrate what was, what is, and what's to come. So, Father, as we come to this moment, Lord, I just pray you drop into our hearts, if you haven't already what it is you want us to pledge to bring, to see your kingdom advanced above and beyond, above and beyond. Expand our territories as we give, bless our giving, as we pledge our giving for the next 12 months, bless our giving in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If today's message did impact you and you gave your life to Jesus, we'd love to hear from you so we can help you take your next steps in your journey with Jesus. So please reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or via our website. We hope to see you again soon.